Welcome to Breaking Down Barriers to Awareness, Unconscious Bias. I am Loretta Summers. This is a condensed version of the two-hour session that Mid-Continent Library offers. I am going to turn off my video, and I will turn it back on at the end so you'll see me again, but I want you all to concentrate on the content of this session, not looking at me in the video. So let me turn that off. And what I have for you here are some pictures to kind of get us thinking about unconscious bias. And the first one here is, and you'll notice it says Sydney Airport. I could not find a picture representing the United States. But what you see here is the average uh, height for a woman. This is the average height for a man. This is the average height for a CEO. Now, the statistics I'm giving you are statistics for people in America. 15% of American men are over six foot tall, yet almost 60%, 60% of American men are over six foot tall. Now, if you go to six foot two inches, less than 4% of American men are over six foot two inches tall, yet more than 36% of corporate CEOs are over six foot two inches tall. Now, Malcolm Gladwell talks about that in his book called The Blink. But, you know, we're, we're trying to wonder, why does this happen? Clearly, corporate boards of directors do not, when they're conducting the search for a CEO or anybody else in the C-suite, they don't send out the message to get us a tall guy. Make sure there are tall men in the applicant pool. Nobody says that. Yet, these are the statistics. Now, similar patterns are true for the generals and admirals in the military, and even for the presidents of the United States. The last elected president whose height was below average was William McKinley in 1896, and he was ridiculed in the press as a little boy. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers Senator Bob Corker. He went to be Secretary of State. But I was in the car and I heard on the news that one of the reasons why he wasn't seriously considered for the position was because of his stature. He is five foot seven inches tall. Question is, is this unconscious bias? This picture is from a long time ago. It is um, Katrina. And you have the Associated Press at the top. You have the Associated Foreign Press at the bottom. But what got everybody's attention when it hit the internet was the wording. You notice that the young black man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store. Associated Foreign Press said, for the white man and woman, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda. And again, the question is, was this unconscious bias? Why is the black man stealing his and the white couple finding? Now people have argued, Loretta, you don't know what's behind the picture. All I see is the picture. I do know this. When Katrina happened, I was watching Katrina very closely. I had friends in New Orleans. I recognized some of them on top of the roof, trying to get off, trying to get out. Nobody, if you listen to the news at all, nobody was going to a store saying, hi, I have money. Can I purchase bread and milk? They said people were scrambling. People were trying to find whatever they could find, wherever they could find it, and they were taking it. So was it unconscious bias when they said the young black man was looting and that the couple in the bottom, the white couple, they found theirs? This was a poster put out by Red Cross for YMCAs. And I'm sure that Red Cross probably told you to read the poster. Please make sure that the poster is diverse because YMCAs support diversity. Uh, they support the community and the community is diverse. But if you notice the picture, none of the brown skinned kids are doing cool things. They're doing not so cool things. None of them are doing cool things. Now, I don't think Red Cross told whoever did the poster, please make sure you make the brown skinned kids the ones who are doing the not so cool stuff. So, was it unconscious bias? Did the person who did the poster even realize? that none of the brown skinned kids were doing cool stuff. This is the back of the box of um, 
Kellogg's Corn Pops. And if you look over to the left, the Corn Pops are all having fun. They're playing in water. They have an arcade going. Um, they're on stilts. They're playing around. I mean, they're having a great time. Now, my understanding is sometimes you will get a burnt Corn Pop in your box. So I think they want to represent a burnt Corn Pop. So there is one. One token burnt Corn Pop. But if you notice, the burnt token corn pop evidently can't play with the rest of them. Now, all the little yellow corn pops, none of them have clothes on. They're all having a good time. None of them have clothes on. But they did put the brown token corn pop in clothes. And they gave him a job. And they gave him a stereotypical job of a janitor. Is that unconscious bias? Some of you might remember this, H&M clothing store came out. And when this hit the internet, oh my goodness, it really caused a big ruckus. If you notice, the big ruckus is the two hoodies. Now, there's another picture with two white boys and a black boy, and they all have hoodies. They're all advertising hoodies, and they're all advertising hoodies with jungle themes. The issue with this picture is you've got the white boy, he's got a jungle theme, and he's got a tiger on his hoodie. You have the black boy, he's got a jungle theme, but the question is, where is the monkey? There's no monkey on his shirt and so who then are you calling the coolest monkey in the jungle are you referring that to be the black boy is he the coolest monkey in the jungle now again they are international they may not have a lot of diversity um, in their company that would pick up on something like this the mother, the black boy's mother, and he live in England. I don't know how old she is. And maybe she doesn't um, know the history behind um, calling black people monkeys. But that created a problem here in the United States and in South Africa who went in and tore up every one of their stores. Now, Mizzou. University of Missouri, they've had some issues with diversity, so they have an initiative. And if you saw the total program, it, there are a lot of pictures. Students were told to come in and to um, have their pictures taken and how they want to be represented in this initiative. So these are the four pictures that were chosen to be put out on the internet. So keep in mind, there are a number of pictures but these were the four that were chosen. And you see it here. Now, as soon as this came out, Mizzou started getting phone calls. Because if you notice, now they're all athletes, but the two young white women, one's gonna be a future doctor, one's gonna be a future corporate financer. The black woman, she says, I am an African-American woman. And the black man says, I am a brother. Now, why, and somebody would say, but you said that that's how they want to represent. Yes, I did. But let me read to you the full statement that the African-American woman made. She said, I am an African-American woman, a sister, a daughter, and a future physical therapist. They didn't put physical therapists up there for her. The black man's statement, I am a brother. Now, I did first hear that or read this or see this, I was thinking he meant brother being like a black man, brother. But here's his statement. I am a brother. I am an uncle. And best of all, I am a leader. They didn't show that. So the question again was this unconscious bias. So our goals for today are to talk about the purpose of bias and I'll give you a little bit of information about the research behind it the filters to which we view and interpret ourselves and others, how it can adversely affect our judgment and decision-making, 
And then at the end, we'll identify some steps for controlling biases in your thinking. So I have some definitions here. This one is perception. And some of you may look at this and say the person's looking toward you. Some of you may say it's looking away from you. Somebody might say, I can see both. But there's a lot of information that our brain is taking in every day, every minute. There's about 11 million pieces of information that hit our brain. Our brain has to find a way to sort all this data. And so we will have different perceptions because perception refers to the ability to discern, sort, and interpret data. When I use the word bias, because nobody likes to say they have a bias, um, here's my definition of a bias. It's an inflexible, positive, or negative preference, a preference inflexible positive or negative preference or an inclination especially one that inhibits impartial judgment now i'm going to give you one that i think is a inflexible positive bias if you have any children mother when that baby was born nobody's going to tell you your baby's ugly nobody's going to tell you that because you carried that baby for however much you carried that baby, that is the most precious baby in the world. And for you fathers who had to live with the mother who carried that baby for those many months, that is your little baby. You love your baby. That is the most precious baby in the world. And the baby may not have any hair. The baby, we might be able to see the veins through the skin. That's your baby. You love your baby. That is the most precious baby in the world. And nobody's going to change your mind about that. That's your bias, and you can hold on to it. It's a positive one. And some of you who are grandparents think those grandkids are the cutest little grandkids. Now, some of us think when we see them out in public that they're some bad kids. But they're your grandkids. You love them, and to you, they will always be the sweetest little things. So that would be my example of a positive, inflexible bias. We're going to talk about some biases today, hopefully, though, that we can do something about. Because bias can also be an unfair act or policy stemming from prejudice. So now we have prejudice, stereotypes. And that's kind of where our biases come from. Our biases come from stereotypes. And it said it could be an unfair act or policy stemming from prejudice. But when you think about stereotypes, that fuel our biases. Um, I have a picture of here of, of a lot of different stereotypes. And every time I look at this one, I see um, the young man that says, I will not cut your grass. And I think about a Latino executive here in, in uh, Johnson County, Kansas, as we know, is one of, one of the most richest counties in Kansas. And this Latino executive owns a home. And when he's out cutting his grass, people will come up to him and ask him how much he charges because they think he is the hired help. And he has to explain to them, I'm not the hired help. This is my house <laughs> and this is my grass. I'm not the hired help. Then I have a picture here um, of another group of stereotypes that I found and stereotype of the angry black woman. And we're kind of seeing that playing out right now. Um, Kamala Harris, who is running on the ticket with Joe Biden as vice president, she's been referred to as angry. I mean, that, that adjective has been used multiple times. And one of the examples was when she was questioning Judge Kavanaugh. And so she's being referred to as the angry black woman, playing into that stereotype. Of course, some people think that everyone who's campaigning for President Trump are racist. Um, I have a stereotype about a picture up here about disabilities. Many people believe that all people who are blind are great musicians or they have a keener sense of smell and hearing. And some people believe that all people who use wheelchairs are docile or they compete in the Paralympics and that all people with developmental disabilities are innocent and sweet natured and that all people with disabilities are sad and bitter. Those are stereotypes. Now, it's sad to say, but stereotypes will always exist. Again, as I mentioned, a lot of information is hidden in our head, our brain, and we've got to find a way to sort it. But what I want you to try to do after this session is 
try to catch yourself if you're making a stereotypical comment. Before you make a comment that uses the word all or implies all, change what you were going to say. Make your statement applicable to the one you know or the ones you've had experience with. Don't imply that everyone in that category behaves a certain way or thinks a certain way or believes a certain thing. It may be true for one or the ones you know, but it's probably not true for everyone in the group. I like this one. Prejudice is a great time saver. You can form opinions without having to get to the facts. And prejudice is a preconceived idea. Most often a negative attitude taken before the facts are known and sustained by overgeneralizations, stereotypes. Prejudice usually implies inferiority and it's a tendency to see differences as weaknesses. Then we have the word discrimination, because I cannot look at you and tell if you're prejudiced. Um, so how will I know? Discrimination is the act of denying opportunities, resources, or access to a person because of his or her group membership. And discrimination can take many forms. We've got racism, sexism, ageism, heterosexism, ableism. It basically is prejudice in action. So I'm going to talk about biases. And before we talk about them, let me say that even nice people have biases, and biases do not make us bad people. We all have them, but they don't make us bad people. And members of any group can have biases. Now, we generally tend to hold biases that favor our in-group, but we can hold biases against our in-group. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm not proud of this. I am human. I have biases, and I have a bias against my own in-group. And it came out in a comment that I made. When I first moved to Overland Park, didn't see a lot of black and brown people in the city. And I was at a gas station um, across from Johnson County Community, excuse me, Johnson County Community College. And um, a friend of mine had come in from St. Louis, where I used to live. And I saw these two young black men in a convertible Mercedes, the SL. Now, I love that car. That is my most favorite car, but I cannot afford it. It is over six figures. But here was the first thing that came out of my mouth when I saw those two young black men. I said, what are those drug dealers doing in Overland Park? And my friend said, what are you talking about? I said, those two black guys, they're in that Mercedes. That's my most favorite car, convertible, SL, six figures. If they're driving a car like that, if they own a car like that, they got to be drug dealers. Who else can they be? He said, you don't recognize them? I'm like, no, I don't recognize them. I don't hang out with drug dealers. Why would I recognize drug dealers? He said, Loretta, you don't recognize them? No. Now, some of you may be able to guess who they were. You don't have to know names. But I'm sure some of you can probably guess who they were. Overland Park, Kansas, two young black men driving a two-seater convertible Mercedes. And most people give me the answer of the Chiefs. That is the correct answer. I will also tell you that saying that they are the chiefs is a stereotypical answer. Now, some people, very few, but some people will tell me athletes. Okay, I still would consider that maybe a stereotypical answer because hardly anybody ever says the royals. People don't say hockey. People don't say soccer players. Um, people don't say a NASCAR driver. No, most people say athlete, and the majority of the people say Kansas City Chiefs. But it just shows you we can have biases against our own in-group. They don't necessarily align with our beliefs. And um, I took the Harvard's Implicit Association test because I don't think I have a bias when it comes to hiring men 
or women in the workplace, with my background being 40 plus years in HR, I think and do believe that uh, women have a place in the workplace. But when I took that test, I came back and said, I do have a bias. It says that my brain makes a quick connection of men having a career and women belonging in the home. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That cannot, no. I'm an HR person. That certainly cannot be my bias. But then I had to think about, why does my brain make that connection so quickly? Well, I'm 40. Well, I'm going to say I'm 47. I've got 47 years of experience in HR, but I'm 67 years old. What did I hear growing up? I mean, it was all around me, TV, family, friends, everywhere, all around me. What did I watch on TV? Ozzie and Harriet, Father Knows Best, Leave it to Beaver. The man went out and did the job. The woman stayed home, had an apron on, cooked dinner for her husband, took care of the house, took care of the kids. And that's what I heard all around me. Men, it's your job to go out, go to work, support your family. Little lady, that's what they called us back then. Little lady, it's your job to stay home, take care of the house, make sure you had food on that table when that man gets home from work, and take care of the kids. When I went to go to college, I asked my daddy, could I go to college? He said, yeah, you can go to college. I'm like, great. He said, get a BS degree and come home with an MRS. Hope you all caught that. And then one thing you don't do is tell a preacher man. My daddy was a pastor of a church. You don't tell a preacher man you don't want to have any kids. But I told him I did not want to have any kids. And what did he do? Oh, my goodness. He went off on me because he said, that's what women were put on this earth for. You were put on this earth to have kids. So just because you have a bias does not necessarily align with your declared beliefs. The biases can have what would affect on behavior and biases can be defeated. What's the purpose of bias? The purpose of bias, you know, we go out in the world every day, we make decisions about what is safe or not, what's appropriate or not. And this automatic decision making is what psychologist Joseph Ledeau has suggested is an unconscious danger detector that determines whether or not something or someone is safe before we even begin to consciously make a determination. So when the object, animal, or person is assessed to be dangerous, then a fight or flight response occurs. Now, on a conscious level, we may correct a mistake in this danger detector when we notice it, but often we simply begin to generate reasons to explain why it was accurate to begin with. But from a survival standpoint, The purpose of bias from a survival standpoint is this is not a negative trait. It is a necessary trait. We've all heard the axiom, it's better to be safe than sorry. And to a huge degree, this is true. Now, where people are concerned, these decisions are hardwired into us. That's why we have to say everybody has biases. The only way you're not going to have a bias is if you're not living. And at earlier times in our history, determining who or what was coming up the path may have been a life or death decision. If a hostile animal, hostile tribe member, you might die. Our minds evolved to make these decisions very quickly, often before we even thought about it. So we all have biases. So this is the first one I want to talk about, the selective attention and attentional bias, which is a mental process which we selectively see some things but not others, depending on our point of focus or what we happen to be focusing on at a particular time. I'm sure some of you maybe have seen this um, video where they're asking people to watch the people in the white shirts pass the ball, and they want them to count the number of times that they pass the ball. So people are focused on the white shirts. And then a six foot gorilla comes into the picture. Now, after the video, they asked people, how many times did the people in the white shirts pass the ball? And a lot of people get the right answer. Some don't. But then they asked them, did you see the gorilla? And they're like, what gorilla? I didn't see a gorilla. 
a six foot gorilla walk through the video. You didn't see it? Nope. Because they were focused on watching the people in the white shirts pass the ball. And, you know, you think about it because we do this every day. Um, you know, people driving, that's why they say they want you to be focused on driving and not on texting or whatever. But, you know, there'll be accidents and people's like, you didn't see that semi truck, that great big semi truck. You didn't see it. They're like, no, I didn't see it. What were you focused on? What were you looking at? What were you paying attention to? And we have selective attention. You know, some of you may have experienced walking down the hall and somebody may have spoken to you and you didn't respond. And then later on, you find out that like, ooh, somebody, you know, I might think that woman's snooty or that man was snooty because when they walked down the hall, I spoke to them, they didn't say anything. Now, if it's brought to your attention, you might apologize. Oh, I apologize. I didn't mean that. But I don't remember seeing you. That might be your response. And the person may come back and say, how could you not see me? I walked right past you. The hallway's not that wide. How'd you not see me? How'd you not hear me? But you didn't. Because you were focused, your mind was somewhere else, and you were focused on that, and you probably didn't see or hear them. So this happens a lot. And even when I show these pictures about what could possibly be unconscious bias, a lot of times people don't, they don't catch it. It's like, what's wrong with this picture? They don't see it. Um, the LGBTQ plus community, they're always paying attention to what's around them. Because they don't know if it's going to be safe for them to talk about their uh, lifestyle. But a lot of us, we don't pay attention to what's around us. We don't pay attention to what's going on outside of our world. Um, for some of you, you may have noticed that if you, women, I'm going to say, if you went to buy a car and you took a man with you just to get his opinion, you're the one buying the car. But when the salesperson starts talking, who does the salesperson talk to? They talk to the man. The man might not even realize it. Some men do. But it's like, the man's not the one buying the car. You are. Um, sometimes when you're in meetings, and if you're the only woman in the meeting, and you say something and nobody responds, and then 15 minutes later, a man will say the same thing. And everybody like, oh, that was a great suggestion. It's like, you made that suggestion 15 minutes ago? Nobody heard you when you said it. What are you paying attention to? I remember going back to Lawrenceburg, Indiana. That's where I grew up. And I was visiting my um, childhood best friend, Jackie, white female. But we went to school together from grade school all the way up to high school. We graduated. And sometimes our mothers dress us alike because there were not that many places to shop in Lawrenceburg. But she was my best friend. So I went back. We had a great lunch. We're walking down the main street of Lawrenceburg. And I see this hotel. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's a hotel. Is it still here? She said, yeah. And I said, in the restaurants, there's still a restaurant inside? She said, yeah. And I said, oh. I said, that was a hotel that I couldn't go into. You know, I couldn't go to the restaurant. She said, what are you talking about? And I said, black people weren't allowed to go into the hotel and sit in that restaurant. So we kept walking. And... We get to the movie theater, and it's still standing. I'm like, oh, my gosh, the Walnut Movie Theater is still here? She said, yeah. And I'm like, oh, another place I couldn't go to. She said, what are you talking about? Now, keep in mind, Jack and I were best friends. She did not know, though, what was going on outside her world. She thought that I was being treated just like she was. But if she didn't have selective attention or inattentional blindness, if she would look to see beyond what was going on in her world, she would realize my world was totally different. Could not go into a restaurant, sit down and eat. Could not go to the movie theater. Could not swim in the swimming pool. Could not, my father couldn't even wait in the bus station for visiting preachers to come to town because it was also a restaurant. And I remember going to get, um, they need some ice cream. There's an ice cream store there where you can get the penny candy, if anybody remembers penny candy. And um, I was told that I had to leave. And I remember running home to my mommy, and I'm crying. Because, again, Jackie's my best friend, and I'm running home. Mommy, 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 the man told me I couldn't sit there and eat my ice cream with Jackie. What's wrong? What, why can't I sit there and eat my ice cream with Jackie? And that's when she explains to me that because of the color of my skin, that is why I could not sit there and eat ice cream with my friend. Now, we're about ready to have our 50th year anniversary. Should have been this year. 
didn't occur because of COVID-19. But they're like, hey, come on back, come on back. And I am in a group and everybody's talking about all these wonderful times they had in Lawrenceburg. And I th I'm thinking, yeah, my experiences aren't the same as yours. I don't recognize all those wonderful times. What are you paying attention to? Now, some of you, when you look at this person, probably have, oh my gosh, this person is, uh, maybe he's a truck driver based on what he has on his shirt. Maybe he's a tattoo artist because he's got some sleeve tattoos. Some people call him a skinhead. Some people think he rides a motorcycle, probably a Harley. Um, some people think there's something in his pocket. Somebody thought it might be a gun. Um, some people think that, yes, he is a, some type of a craft worker, um, laborer of some type, all kinds of thoughts about this person. And they're making a diagnosis based on what they see. Here's that same person. He happens to be a doctor. But think about the many times that we have, based on a first impression, diagnosed someone, made up a life story about them, gave them a career, just like we just did with the gentleman here, and then found out later that we were wrong. Have you ever been misdiagnosed? Have anybody thought something about you? And then you find out later, oh man, now that I got to know you, you're not like I thought you were. We do this all the time. And we've got to think about, is my bias accurate? My diagnosis accurate? Am I treating that person as if my bias is true? My diagnosis is true? And if I find out that my diagnosis is not true, have I treated that person unfairly? And that happened to me. I happen not to like pants on the ground, um, men who wear their pants on the ground. Now this happens to be a conscious bias. This is not unconscious for me. This is a conscious bias. I don't like men, men who wear pants on the ground. But what I found myself doing as a young man who came into one of my classes, I wasn't treating him very well. I hollered at him, told him to sit down and shut up because he kept talking while I was trying to talk. And um, I was thinking he wasn't really there to learn. Maybe he wasn't even capable of learning what I was trying to teach him. And there's another young man there, and he is trying to learn. He even said to people, hey, Loretta, pay attention to Miss Loretta. She's trying to help us. I was there to help them get a job. So I was working with them on their resumes and interviewing skills. Now, the young man has pants on the ground. Again, I didn't treat him very nice. Um, the young man who I thought was paying attention and uh, was really learning, I would chit-chat with him on break. And um, all I can tell you is I found out at the end of the class when they went to do their interviews that my bias, my diagnosis was wrong. The person who did the best interview was the young man who I thought wasn't listening or paying attention who I did not pay attention to. And the young man who did the worst in the interview was the one who I thought was learning. He did not get, he, I should have worked with him. He did not get the service that I should have provided. He did not get the help that he needed because I diagnosed him as catching on and understanding everything I was talking about. And I thought, my goodness, how unfair I have been with both of those young men. Now, this is an exercise. I'm just going to show it very quickly. And um, I want you to think about what the answer is to the question. It's simple addition. All you got to do is add up some numbers. It would be very easy to do. Please don't use your calculator. Here's the first one. If I ask you what the answer is, some of you are going to say 5,000. Now, some of you may give me the right answer. Um, some say 4,090. 4, some say 4,100. Most people say 5,000. And 5,000 is the wrong answer. It's 4,100. Now, the reason for the error is attributed to the tendency of the human mind to shift whenever possible from a conscious, energy-intensive thinking mode to a habitual 
pattern-based, low-energy, reflective thinking mode. And that's exactly what happened. Your brain saw a pattern. It stopped thinking. It went into autopilot. Now, what does this represent? What bias? Patterns, stereotypes. It saw a pattern. It saw a stereotype. Think about how we want to do things based on what we have experienced in the past. We generally want to see things as the same as other things we've seen. It is safer and more dependable to deal with them in that way. So stereotyping is a strong form of pattern recognition. So I need you to think about what are the patterns that your unconscious mind produces about people? And what kind of things do you assume to be true based on prior experience? Here's another bias. Confirmation bias. We actively try to support what we already believe rather than trying to find out where we might be wrong. We seek out information that confirms our view and we interpret ambiguous or mixed information to confirm our existing theories. The tension, and I'm going to give you an example of this, because the tension between the noble ideology of equality and the cruel reality of genocide, enslavement, and colonization had to be reconciled. So we're going back in the day now. Thomas Jefferson, who owned slaves, suggested that there were natural differences between white people and the black slaves and others. And he asked scientists to find them. Now, to illustrate the power of our questions to shape the knowledge that we validate, these scientists didn't ask, are blacks and others inferior? They went out to answer the question, why are blacks and others inferior? They were looking for information to confirm the bias that blacks and others are inferior. This confirmation bias is one of the many natural inclinations we have in our thinking and decision-making. Our patterns of belief and their impact are so deeply ingrained and so concealed in our unconscious that it becomes difficult for us to fully understand their impact on our decision-making. Our minds automatically justify our decisions, excuse me, our decisions, blinding us to the true source or beliefs behind our decisions. And ultimately, we believe our decisions are consistent with our conscious biases, which in fact, when in fact, our unconscious is running the show. And here's some other examples of confirmation bias. On Facebook, I bet you that most of the people who are on Facebook with you or any of your other social media um, um, platforms that are people who believe the same thing you believe, think very similar to the way that you think. And if somebody posts something on your Facebook page that you disagree with, some of you, including me, may hide the posting because you don't want your other friends to see it. Or you may stop following that person if they just keep putting things on there that you don't agree with. And in some cases, I've seen some of my friends actually say, if you don't like what I'm saying on Facebook, fine, unfriend me. So they only want to be friends with people who believe the same thing in the same way that they do. If you're watching TV, there's certain news stations that you like. Now, you may turn to the other news station and listen to it, but if that other news station is saying things that you do not agree with, you're going to go back to the station that is saying things that you can sit there and say, yes, I agree, I agree, I understand, yes. And then people wonder why we have arguments in church, because church has biases too. And we get in arguments over the Bible. Why? People will pick out verses of the Bible that support their belief and act like the rest of the Bible is not even there. Now, whatever our belief is, we get committed to it. Commitment confirmation, lost aversion bias. And the escalation of commitment bias can be explained by thinking of people who play the lottery. 
like many of us, you know, we buy lottery tickets or scratchers because we have this idea that we will be the one who will win, even though the odds are not in our favor. Even when we lose time after time, and our money slowly dwindles, we drive back to the store, buy another ticket, because we just know that we will win this time. Now, if we think logically about the lottery, we would realize that the odds are not in our favor. And that is why the sums of money could possibly win, that we could possibly win are so large. These large sums of money put our logic to the side and makes the lottery addictive because we have hope that we will be the next winner. Now, another way that you can look at confirmation bias, the opposite, the lost aversion perspective, people prefer to avoid losing more than they prefer pursuing a game. So for an example, people don't want to wear, people don't want to be required, let me say that differently, people don't want to be required to wear a mask. They want to avoid losing their freedom to wear a mask or not to wear a mask. So they want to avoid losing their freedom versus gaining a reduction in the spread of COVID-19 or gaining the probability that they will not get COVID-19. But once we take ownership of an ideology, we tend to value it more than it's worth. And we hate to lose an argument. However, we run the risk of dismissing others' ideas that might simply be better than ours. And the mind finds a way to self-justify these decisions rather than accept that we are wrong. And this dynamic even affects our willingness to look at bias in ourselves. You know, we, we want to think of ourselves as fair people. You know, nobody wants to admit that they're prejudiced. Nobody wants to admit that they have biases, even though we all have prejudices and we all have biases. Nobody wants to admit that. And when we get feedback that we may have a bias or that we've done something that indicates we are prejudiced, <laughs> what's our reaction? What's your reaction? Commitment confirmation, lost aversion bias. The trusted 10 exercise. Now, I'm not going to give you time, obviously, to do 10, but I want you to think about a couple of people that you really trust, not family members, but people that you really, 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 really trust. Trust with your life. Maybe this is your power of attorney, but somebody you really trust. But if you put them up against these categories I have here, and I've got two people I'm thinking of, um, we're all around the same age, we're all female. One is white, two of us are black. We're all the same politics. We all have the same religion. One is married, two of us are single. One has a high school diploma. Two of us have college degrees. Um, all of us are heterosexual. None of us have disabilities. We have a tendency out of all the people that we meet, that 1% that we really trust are going to be very much like us. Share the same habits, same values, same ideas. But why does this matter? When we surround ourselves with people who are that much like us, we are never pressured to grow. We're never pressured to see things from a different angle. We're never pressured to challenge our own assumptions. But diversity is healthy. It's healthy in government, in organizations, in societal communities, and it's healthy even in families because it forces us to take different perspectives. But the question is, if you're really comfortable around people who you have an affinity toward, because this is the affinity bias, if you're really comfortable around people you have an affinity toward, hmm, how are you treating those that you don't have an affinity toward? How are you treating those who are different than you? In the workplace, do you invite them to lunch or even not even in the workplace. Do you invite people that you know that might not be your trusted friend, but, you know, to expand your trusted friend family? Did, have you ever thought about asking other people out to lunch? 
you know, we do come into work and we chit chat with everybody. Hey, how was your weekend or whatever? But there's some people there that might be new employees. We haven't formed affinity toward. We leave them out of that conversation. Who do you go to for advice? Do you go to the same people? And do you go to, to try to get advice from those that you know already think the way you think? So they're not going to challenge at all? Do you overlook people's mistakes that you have an affinity toward, but those you don't have an affinity? Oh my goodness, they made a mistake. In the new Jim Crow book, there was an example that was shared that I think exemplifies the affinity bias. And the U.S. attorney was talking to an assistant U.S. attorney, and that assistant U.S. attorney wanted to drop the charges against a defendant in a case in which there were no extenuating circumstances. And she asked assistant U.S. attorney, why do you want to drop the gun offense? And he said, he's a rural guy. He grew up on a farm. The gun he had with him was a rifle. He's a good old boy. And all good old boys have rifles. And it's not like he was a gun-toting drug dealer, but he was a gun-toting drug dealer. Exactly. But they wanted to let him off the hook because an affinity toward a rural guy who grew up on a farm. This is the research, several different pictures here. Um, I'm gonna start with the one on the right, the orchestra. Again, this was talked about in Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Blink. U.S. orchestras revealed women's odds of making it past the first round of auditions increased 50%, five zero, with blind auditions. Blind auditions doubled the probability Ooh, excuse me, doubled the probability that a woman would advance from preliminary rounds from 20 to 40%. I think about that when I think about American Idol, Jennifer Hudson. She was a contestant on American Idol. And um, I don't know if y'all know Jennifer Hudson, the woman can sing, but on Broadway, been in movies, they have her at different award ceremonies. I mean, the woman has a beautiful voice. Voice. She's done very well as a singer. But Simon Cowell told her she would never, ever be an American Idol. And he was basing his comment on her weight. American Idol, you don't choose people to be American Idols based on their weight. It's supposed to be based on their talent. So I think about the voice. We have the voice now where they can't see the person. And I also heard that maybe they are going to put the contestants so that the audience can't see them either because they think that there might be a bias. Now, why are they thinking there might be a bias based on who you see? Are they a woman? Are they a man? Are they uh, heavy set? Are they slim? Are they black? Are they white? Well, the resumes I have here, there was a case study, identical resumes. Everything is the same on the resume except for the name. So readers were asked to evaluate recent PhD graduates for an assistant professor position, one with a man's name, one with a woman's name. And they found that 79% of applicants with a man's name versus only 49% of those with a woman's name were even considered worthy of hire. And then there were four times as many doubt rating comments for the female applicant. They would make comments like, well, I would need to see proof of scholarship. So they did this again. This time they did it with African-American sounding names and white American sounding names. Again, identical resumes. Only thing they changed was the name. And they found that white names received 50% more callbacks and higher quality white resumes received 30% more callbacks while higher quality African-American resumes received a smaller increase. And they also noticed that, remember these are fictitious applicants, aside from race, those that lived in better neighborhoods received more callbacks. 
Now, here in the Kansas City area, I know that we have biases, and you all can't tell me we don't, because um, we have biases about people who live in Kansas City, Kansas, versus Kansas City, Mo versus Johnson County. We have biases about, did you go to K-State, KU, MU, Baker, Ottawa? So if we have biases about that, I know we have biases about names. In the last name, first name, I work for outplacement center, our office, and people who do have foreign names often change their name. They either Americanize it, or if their first name sounds like it might be from another country, they'll use initials. Now, this was another one. This is performance. Now, these are law partners. Now, you know law lawyers are going to say they don't have any biases. Law partners were given a mistake-heavy law memo to grade, and all partners received the same memo, and they were uh, under the impression of a writing analysis study. Now, half of the memos listed the author as a third-year associate who was African-American. The other half noted a white author. When the law partner thought the author was black, the memo scored a 3.2. Whereas the same memo scored a 4.1 when they thought the author was white. There was also a drastic difference in the qualitative comments. White authors were described as having potential, whereas black authors got comments like, I can't believe he went to NYU. And these findings suggest that unconscious confirmation bias affected the evaluator's perceptions of the memo. Because despite the intention to be unbiased, we see more errors when we expect to see errors. And we see fewer errors when we do not expect to see errors. There was another, oh, let me go back. There was another um, study based on performance. And that was done about men and women when they work together uh, on tasks. And this study said women are given less credit for the successful outcome. There's made as having made smaller contributions to it, and they're blamed more for failure. This was in the Journal of Applied Psychology. Men typically attribute their success to innate qualities and skills, while women often attribute theirs to external factors such as working hard, getting lucky, or I got help from others. And because women receive less credit, and give themselves less credit, their confidence often erodes and they are less likely to put themselves forward for promotions and stretch assignments. So it seems that whenever there's any ambiguity about the performance of an individual, these biases come to play. But if it's made clear that the woman is competent, the negative expectations are undercut from the start. Now, YouTube, when they made iOS, launched it for YouTube, couldn't figure out why 5 to 10% of the videos were uh, up, uploaded upside down. They're like, why are these upside down? And what they found was that the people who designed iOS for YouTube were right-handed. And they didn't realize that left-handed people typically wrote their, rotate their phones 180 degrees to record the videos. Amazon, they're like, okay, we're going to take the bias out of the human and we're going to put it into artificial intelligence and have the artificial intelligence look at resumes and it won't be biased. But they used 10 years of resumes that Amazon had received for a software developer job. But who were the majority of those 10,000 resumes or 10 years of resumes? They were men. So they taught the artificial intelligence to prefer male candidates over female candidates. And especially if the female candidate's resume said women's chess club captain, or they went to all, to all women's colleges, the system actually penalized those resumes. So they had to scrap it because they built unconsciously, they built bias into their system. Now, teachers say, hey, Loretta, you know, I, I, I love all my kids. Bias doesn't start with my kids. I love them all. Well, they gave teachers, 135 teachers, a video, showed them a video. 
four children, one black boy, one white boy, one black girl, one white girl. They ask them to look for problematic behavior. The kicker was there is no problematic behavior in the video at all. And they used eye tracking technology to see who did they watch. Both the black and white teachers spent much more time watching the black children, particularly the black boy. 42% of the teachers believe the black boy needed the most attention. 34% the white boy, 13% the white girl, 10% chose the black girl. So when you put the black boy and the black girl together, 52%. So these are some of the biases. So in my last few minutes, how can we combat some of these biases? First, I hope you, would, hope you will admit that you have biases. As I mentioned, we all have prejudices. We all have biases. So recognize our, we're human and our brain's going to make a mistake without us even knowing it. But you need to evaluate subtle messages. Biases are subtle. You know, telling, telling a black person you are so articulate implies a bias. Telling a Latinx or an Asian, oh, you speak English so well, that implies a bias. Telling suburban housewives, you're now safe. Low-income housing won't be coming to the suburbs. That implies a bias. Talk to people you don't normally talk to. You might find out that you really have a lot more in common. And you could have an affinity toward them as if you just took the time to talk to them. We need to hold everyone accountable. If you hear a stereotypical statement, ask the person, do they really mean all? Or are they referring just to the one they know or the ones they know? If you hear somebody making a comment that you might be biased, ask them if their evidence, if it's based on a stereotype, ask them what their evidence is, what the facts are. And we make to take the perspective of others. Put yourself in their shoes. You know, we tend to assume that others share our knowledge and our preferences and our attitudes. In some homogeneous situations, that assumption may be a fair one. But in the era of diversity, where knowledge, preferences, and attitudes differ, that assumption may be seriously flawed. And we need to practice empathy. Because when empathy fails, when we fail to try to take the perspective of the other person, we judge others based on stereotypes rather than a true understanding of the other's nature or situation. And question your first impression, your first diagnosis, it very well could be wrong. So gather some facts and be willing to adjust your opinion and you're thinking. And then if you can justify your decision, if you can write it down, and if you can make others justify it, if they can actually write it down, then it's probably not a bias. But if people say, well, I just, it's just my gut, it just feels, then it might be a bias playing out. And ask for feedback. What do you hear me say? I say things, some of them I don't hear myself, and people have to say, Loretta, I'm like, oh wow, yep, you're right. I said that, and that's not what I meant. Make decisions collectively. You can do that. That kind of cuts down the biases when there's more than one of us that are making that decision. And then practice mindfulness. Pay attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. We're going to have to keep this in the forefront of our minds. So what did we talk about today? We talked about the purpose of bias, a little bit about the research behind it, or at least behind unconscious bias. Talked about some filters through which we view and interpret ourselves and others. We talked about how it can adversely affect our judgment and decision making. And then we identified some steps for controlling some biases in our thinking. If you would like to get more information on this topic, Again, Mid-America, not Mid-America, I'm sorry, Mid-Continent Library does have a two-hour session that they offer. So please feel free to 
um, sign up for that course when you see it offered. Right now, uh, we are currently doing the course um, because of COVID-19 via Zoom. And hopefully someday we'll all be able to get back together and be able to see each other and talk to each other and have a conversation about breaking down barriers to awareness, unconscious bias. Thank you for your time and your attention. I appreciate it. I did tell you that I was going to turn my video on again. Here's my video so you all can see me. I'm glad that you spent this time with me today. I wish you the best. Please, everyone, be safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye.